Okay, so this session's final presentation has implications on marine and human health. The presentation is on paralytic shellfish toxins in fish and invertebrates of South Central and Southwest Alaska, given by Bruce Wright, who's a senior scientist at the Kinnick Tribe. So Bruce, please teach us more on this important subject. So you can see that, okay, I can read my notes, okay. Looks great. Okay, now I need to move this out of the way. Okay, here we go. Um, so uh, I'm Bruce Wright. I'm the senior scientist at the Connect Tribe. This is kind of a follow-up to a presentation I gave a couple of years ago. We have uh, more data on paralytic shellfish poisoning in fish and especially in salmon. So I thought you guys would be interested to see what we have for an update and, um, and help me uh, figure out some of the questions we, we need to, uh, to address. Uh, so we're going, I'm going to present results from an ongoing effort This started in 2006 um, to examine the trophic transfer of paralytic shellfish toxins. I'll we'll be using PSP here in the marine food web. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about uh, PSP poisoning and its effects, uh, the transfer uh, um, trophic transfer project objectives and the different players involved uh, quickly talk about the study design and then get to the, uh, the results of uh, forage fish and predatory fish. Well, I don't have time to talk about uh, the data that we have from, um, from the uh, invertebrates, but I know you're mostly interested in the, uh, in the fish and then a summary. The, uh, the players are uh, all across the country, uh, a, a bunch of teams. We have to work together because we're covering a pretty large area and, um, and it helps with uh, funding the different, the different data collection that we have to do. So PSP or paralytic shellfish poisoning, some people refer to it as red tide, although it doesn't cause red tides, is a serious human health risk for shellfish consumers in Alaska people that eat mostly clams and, and mussels. Uh, PSP outbreaks have occurred across much of the southern coast with a number of fatalities, actually the numbers in the hundreds um, over, the, over the decades. And over the last few decades, um, we've had a number of fatal fatalities. And the most recent was in July, 2020, a person that was eating bivalves and marine snails um, died from PSP in uh, on Alaska. PSP ca is caused by toxins produced by a microscopic, uh, usually single cell, but sometimes cells in, uh, in strings, uh, dinoflagellate called Alexandrium cantonella. Alexandrium blooms occur across most of the Alaska coastline. We found their overwintering cysts up into the, the Bulford Sea. Alexandrium reaches its highest abundance in the, May, in, in the uh, summer and spring, usually May through August. Although toxin levels may be dangerously high throughout the year. And I think most people know that butter clams concentrate and hold the toxins for well over a year. So there's no safe months for eating some bivalves. Because Alexandrian blooms are so prevalent in Alaska, we've hypothesized that PSP toxins end up in other, other organisms as well. So that's the subject of our project is to examine the occurrence of PSP toxins in the marine food web. We've tested a variety of marine organisms for toxins during the Alexandrian bloom season in order to assess the risks involved. Uh, risk to marine predators through trophic transfer of toxins and risk to, Alaska, to the Alaska fishing industry due to potential presence of toxins in commercially harvested fish. Potential risk to human health through fish and invertebrate consumption. So the results we found that following Alexandrian blooms, PSP toxins are transferred to a wide variety of fish and invertebrates 
sometimes reaching very high levels. Let me go into the methods now. So study design, <clears throat> we collected samples of phytoplankton and zooplankton for Alexandrium cells and looked at toxins. We looked at forage fish, including juveniles of larger fish like salmon and cod and key keystone prey species that support fish, marine mammals, seabirds, and other high level predatory uh, species, including the predatory fish. We looked at uh, five salmon species in Alaska and Pacific halibut. <clears throat> the study area included an array of sampling locations from southern southeast Alaska all along the Gulf Coast, including the Aleutian Islands and up into the Bering Sea. We compared toxin concentrations among different organisms, among internal organs in predatory fish species like salmon and halibut. And we looked at toxin levels in different geographic locations. And that's what all, that's the data I'll present to you. So here you can see the results so far from PSP toxins in forage fish. The results are from 340 samples, 14 species, collected from 2014 to 2021. Toxin concentrations are on the y-axis in a log scale and is expressed in nanograms, uh, micrograms of saxitoxin equivalent per 100 grams of tissue, which is standard for looking at PSP toxins. The red reference line is the advisory limit of 80 micrograms per 100 grams. And this is used by the US FDA for shellfish and fish equivalents. And it's, or it's equivalent to uh, 800 nanograms per gram. Most people refer to it in, in my line of business, uh, looking at PSP and uh, micrograms per 100 grams. So that's the red line up there at 80. Anything above that is considered dangerously toxic. The highest toxin levels were found in Pacific sand, sand lance near 800. It was a sand lance collected from Deering in Nort Norton Sound that was dead on the beach. Pacific herring greater than 400. Uh, those were found in Unalaska out in the Aleutians and uh, juvenile Dolly Varden. And those were found along the Aleutians. That's a char species. These species are important keystone species. Lower levels and other species from the ocean uh, were juvenile chum salmon, coho, pink, and sockeye salmon. <clears throat> we were not able to collect any juvenile chinooks. So you can see that all of these forage species that salmon feed on and adult Pacific cod and the like um, have toxin levels in them. Turning to the predatory fish, here are the plots showing the toxin levels in the salmon species and Pacific halibut. Plots are similar to the last graph where the y axis is a log scale and a reference line at 80 micrograms per 100 grams. That's that red line. The numbers of samples is given in each species. So up at the top, you can see the end, the top of each graph in blue. Toxin levels in the major tissues included digestive organs, liver, kidney, muscle tissues, which is the fillet, roe if it was present, and stomach contents if they were undigested. We were actually able to sample some of the stomach contents of some of the predatory salmon, mostly that was um, sand lance that were in the, uh, in the, adult, in the, uh, the salmon. Overall, the highest toxin levels were observed in the liver, kidney, and digestive organs. This pattern indicates a dietary source of toxins that was absorbed and then processed in the excretory organs. Concentrations 
were very low in the muscle and row. Highest toxin levels were found in the liver and kidney of coho and Chinook salmon. Substantial levels in the pink and red salmon as well. So frequency of toxins, here's some summary data on the frequency of, of fish and the toxins. And forage uh, fishes, about 40% of the samples had um, pretty low levels, less than five micrograms. And most of the time, these are even non-detectable, less than five micrograms per 100 grams. 40% had low levels of five to 10 micrograms per 100 grams. 2% had levels of 10 to 20 micrograms per 100 grams, and 7% had levels greater than 20 micrograms. We don't know yet what these levels mean. We don't know if, if a forage fish has levels of 20 micrograms, if that forage fish um, loses its ability to avoid being preyed upon by salmon, so it's more likely to be, to be preyed upon. Uh, we, do, um, we don't know what levels are toxic to salmon um, in their liver, um, but we're, go, we're starting to do some, uh, some laboratory research on that. Predatory fish are a little harder to compare as we look at the organs, but we'll compare um, the organs of the uh, uh, liver and, and uh, kidneys. So in Chinook, 22% of the fish had high toxin levels in the liver and 38% had uh, high levels in the kidney. This may indicate more frequent consumption of toxic prey. You know, as we know that, that silver coho and uh, king salmon often eat uh, um, larger predator, larger uh, prey fish and, and are frequently found to eat uh, adult sand lance. Notably, the highest toxin levels in Chinook occurred in the Aleutians following a very intense Alexandrian bloom in 2020. And that's when that person died in the Aleutians from eating uh, PSP contaminated marine bivalves and uh, snails. For sockeye and cohos, we had lower frequency of fish with high toxin levels in their organs. Halibut had the lowest toxin levels. Uh, we tested um, organs in a few other species, including sculpin, rockfish, and Pacific cod. And actually, we found pretty elevated levels in Pacific cod. Now, here's the, uh, here's the predatory fish data. When I gave this presentation a couple, three years ago, somebody in the crowd asked, um, what about, what's the risk of people that eat the, make a pate and, and eat the king salmon livers, especially along the Yukon River? And uh, I believe there is a risk of PSP toxicity to humans. Um, and I offer to, to test liver uh, uh, samples. If you want to send, send those to me, I'd be happy to test them for you. Um, so in summary, we found PSP toxins are readily transferred to a variety of uh, biota following an Alexandrian bloom. Highest where and when Alexandrian blooms are in, intense. In, in forage fish, 60% of the samples contained at least low level toxin concentrations. Highest in the keystone forage species, sand lance and herring. This indicates a risk to higher predators. Recent data from PSP toxins in marine mammals show pervasive exposure to toxins. And our data explain why this is the case because they feed on these, these in the marine food web, of course. For predatory fish, toxins are largely restricted to the digestive tract and excretory organs. Albert seemed to be very low in toxins overall, highest in organs of Chinook salmon, 
lowest in mussels and roe, suggesting low risk to the fishing industry, low human health risk unless organs like the liver are consumed. For instance, salmon livers are consumed uh, as a form of, uh, um, mostly along the Yukon River, I understand. So uh, you can con contact me via email or go to the Connect Tribe, my phone number's there. But uh, go to the Connect Tribe and I have a document on there on how to eat bivalves and uh, in, a, in a safe manner. And, uh, and there's more information about the PSP project on that website. So that's in, and I'll leave that, that website address up in case anybody has uh, questions. Thank you very much, Bruce. That was really interesting research that, that the Knick tribe has conducted there. Um, we are out of time, but there was, maybe you can speak very briefly about, someone wondered about if you found any concentrations in crabs or not. In, in uh, what? I didn't understand that. In, a, in crabs? Yes, actually I did a study down in, uh, it's like a several year study down in uh, Haines. That's a really good question. Um, it, it followed the year that a gentleman down there had eaten the, the crab butter, the, the hepatopancreas, the crab guts, right? And, uh, and they had been cooked. So he cooked the, they had cooked the crab whole and he ate, he ate the guts, basically. And some people like to do that. And he ended up dying from PSP because uh, the levels were high. And so we, did a, we followed up by doing a three-year study in the Haines area during that time we had a uh, pretty intense uh, PSP bloom and collected uh, some mussels um, at one of the monitoring sites that set the record for the state at 23,000 micrograms per 100 grams. And remember 80, 80 is the FDA limit and they were at uh, 23,000. The crab were pretty toxic. So there's a safe way to eat crab and that is clean them first before you cook them get rid of the, all the guts and the, the meat seems to always stay uh, below the regulatory limit. That's a good question. Thank you, Bruce. Um, there are a couple of other questions, but we are out of time for the session. So I just wanted to thank our speakers again. And just to remind people, the symposium booklet has everyone's contact information. So if you'd like to follow up with the presenters, uh, please feel free to do that um, and they can address any additional questions that you have. 